So I'll be going down there a month or two again to go help out more. Like, um, I hope you have enjoyed the conference so far. Our sponsors are Asian Corporation, Swage Law, Cleveland Hungarian Development Panel, the University of Akron, Cleveland Rotary Club, Lithuanian American Community, Cleveland Chapter, Slovenian Museum and Archives, the City of Cleveland, and our host, Cleveland Public Library. So today we are going to hear a presentation on, on both Cleveland and the Fair Project's Beatridge Project. Uh, first, we'll watch a short video, uh, which is a courtesy of the Museum, Museum of Agriculture in Slovenia, which will provide some background on the artistic inspiration for this project. Painted behind frontal panels are a speciality of world or culture and originate from Slovenia. The panels feature varied motifs that were painted on the front side of wooden pipes from its granite, which are placed into apia. They reflect the notion of a world of simple human beings. In the land of the famous teacher of agriculture, Anton Yansha, the rich tradition of rural painting, as well as the great development and profitability of beekeeping, paved the way for this world. Biblical motifs on beehive frontal panels depict stories about the creation of love and sin. This vivid and clear composition depicts Adam and Eve in paradise after the original sin. A clear and exceptional depiction of the Virgin Mary with the child and the universal Christian saint. This was among the most common of the world motifs painted on beehive frontal panels. This frontal panel dates from the first half of the 19th century. It depicts two events, the birth of Christ and the arrival of the three kings. Despite its exposure to the effects of outdoor weather, the picture is well maintained due to its earthly colors. The image of saints on frontal panels was thought to protect bees and beekeepers. The motif of Saint Florian, the patron saint of firefighters and floods, was unmissable from APS. In the 18th century, the universal patron saint of beekeepers was Job. When he was tested by God and sat full of wounds on a pile of manure, he painted a fiddler in worms. The worms then turned into gold coins. When he ate the worms to his wife, they turned into wasps, flies, or bees. Beekeepers were always satisfied if they could calmly smoke a pipe in front of their apiaries and the bees walk well, leading to an increase in the number of their families. The Austrian Emperor Franz Joseph long ruled over Slovenian territory. He is depicted on this frontal panel with his beautiful wife Elizabeth, CC, between ornate vases of flowers and drapery. Numerous paintings on frontal panels make fun of women's temperament and village craftsmen. This battle depicts an argument between a shoemaker and his wife where his tools can be seen flying through the air. In the 19th century, organized education slowly reduced illiteracy among the Slovenian population. This picture, shown in a red rock style frame, depicts a school classroom with a teacher with a patronizing voice and pupils who all but one are holding their nerves. Something smells bad. An exotic motif showing American Indians who connect two white women. The sophisticated painter was familiar with the work of the Slovenian missionary Friedrich Bayerga among the indigenous Ottawa and Ojibwa tribes from the area of the Great Lakes in America. The Museum of Agriculture in Lodica has been operating for 60 years. It features the largest collection of painted beehive frontal panels. Many of these are exhibited as part of the permanent. 
invite you to visit us in the middle of the time. Thank you. That was a wonderful video about the freedom culture of painting with the eyes. Um, so today um, we have our presenters here uh, to present on how this particular artistic tradition and the beating culture are carrying to people in these writing. So we'll welcome our uh, presenters, Tanisha Velez. She was born and raised in Cleveland's Park Clinton neighborhood. Tanisha recognizes the importance of working together to change lives for the better. As part of the role at the Access Radius, everyone, fair, um, Tanisha coordinates the Heart Smart program, providing nutrition education, cooking demos, purchasing incentives, and healthcare resources in corner stores and independent grocery stores. Educates uh, youth about uh, entrepreneurship through agriculture with hopes of inspiring young people to continue school or possibly start a business. Uh, another presenter we have is Trey Williams. Trey Williams is the founder of Food Honey and Chief Environmental Officer of Luba, Leaders of Our Future America. Trey founded Food Honey in 2020 to help his friend bring education to their neighborhood on the southeast side of the country. His goal with Food Honey is to create a lot of economic development in Mount Clayton, their neighborhood with the environment farm. And our final presenter, uh, Shirley Bell Wheeler, who will be here very shortly, is an alumnus of Cleveland State University with an undergraduate degree in education, graduate degree in clinical mental clinical mental health counseling and focus on the arts. She, she resides on the east side of Cleveland where she is an active participant in the community. After graduation, she began her career at the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. As an educator and Ohio Guide Store Mental Counselor, she founded elements of uh, sorry, she founded elements of inter internal movement, a nonprofit in Revolutionary Love Community Garden became um, growing in 2017. She was blessed to refocus her career on a uh, career on full-time community in the spring of 2022. Her approach to non-traditional learning experiences includes focusing on social emotional learning, artistic expression, environmental science, and sensory experiences. So before we start that, I also want to thank all of our funders for this critical community project. Uh, we are Kankoka Arts and Culture, um, our Ohio Arts and Culture, and also uh, American Immigration Council, who said, gave us a uh, funding for this critical project in a fellowship. So we welcome all of us. Hello, everybody. Thank you, guys, um, for being here. So we. <coughs> What uh, Sophia mentioned about the Weave Ridge Project. Um, uh, so in 2021, first of all, how did we get here, right? How did we decide to put 11 hives across Cleveland? Um, in 2021, there was a project led by a neighborhood development organization, um, and they were kind of being aware of our bees and, the, and how the population was declining. So they wanted to, they applied for a grant, and they got funding to buy flowers for the community. Um, so after that, they're like, hey, so should we talk to FAIR and try to see like how we can um, understand more about beekeeping? So FAIR came in and we started bringing people in that knew about beekeeping and how to, um, how to bring in more of the community. So then we partnered up with Garden Boys. They're an organization in the east side of Cleveland that they help, uh, they have a community garden and then they also do beekeeping with young adults, young children, um, particular boys. Um, so yeah, so then we started creating a beekeeping initiative that would create connections <coughs> to Cleveland's diverse culture communities and offer support strategizing those um, partnerships with city councils, uh, with the culture garden, and the 
the Slovenian Council, um, funding the project, right? How do we get money for all this stuff that we're doing? Um, and then we started doing the Bee Bridge project lead on it. We designed the program. Uh, we recruited beekeepers, so we put an intake form out there into our um, networks, right? And then we sent the link to other people from there. We got about 23 different people that applied for the program. Um, and then this is my three children. We drove to Strongsville, and then we got 140,000 bees in the back of our car. Wow. <laughs> that was the most quietest ride ever. <laughs> no arguing, no nothing. It was just my <laughs> um, But yeah, that, that's us picking up the packages. You can see this one right here. He's like, what is going on? Um, but yeah, that was us, and that's how we started. Um, and then this is a map, this is my youngest with the little bee there. So this is a drone, it's a male drone, uh, I mean a male bee. Um, so they don't sting, so that's why he's like, I'm okay with this. Um, but here is all the sites that we have across Cleveland. Uh, so we have some in, I don't know exactly like where, but Mount Pleasant where their sites are at. We have one in East Cleveland, thank you. Um, <laughs> This is a Bel Air Puritist neighborhood that there's one there. Um, and then we also have one in Community College. Nice to try to see around here. Um, so the purpose of the Bee Bridge pro Project. Um, so we're trying to increase awareness of beekeeping, right? We know that the population is decreasing every year by half. Um, so that was my main reason why I'm like, I want to take this off. Um, and then so increase awareness of beekeeping and pollination. Offer the opportunity to communities uh, to create that diverse and inclusive um, beekeeping strategy and all that. Um, then also to create community togetherness through beekeeping. Uh, removing those barriers is kind of expensive to be a beekeeper. So we wanted to create that very no expense on them to come in and become beekeepers. Uh, build bridges between cultures and neighborhoods in Cleveland. Um, expanded and diversified networks of experienced beekeepers who are mentors, so each site had their hives, right, their bees, all this equipment, um, but they were also paired up with a mentor, um, which Trey was uh, Shirley's mentor, a new beekeeper, which we had it at her site, and she was the beekeeper, and then we also paired with an artist within that community. Um, and yeah, and then creating connections between community, artists, beekeepers, and community garden sites. So uh, where, the, where are the program components? Um, so identifying the new community sites interested in adding a hive to their garden. And like I mentioned, there was 23 of them um, that were interested in overall, like, can we please have one here? Um, identifying the interested beginning beekeeper and experienced mentors. Finding those local artists in that community to create a workshop. Um, purchase all the materials and equipment and bees. Uh, learn the basics of beekeeping. Host community events. So each site had three events. Um, it was the artist workshop where they got the Slovenian culture, where they painted the hives with um, with the story of that community. Um, then we created orchard mason bee workshops where there's over 500 species of bees. So not all bees live in a hive. They're all separate. They do what they want to do, um, but they help pollinate, right? So that was the main goal for the orchard mason bee workshop and then the honey extraction workshop. Um, and then what makes a good site for a beehive? So uh, Trey can probably talk more on this part about what's a good site on beekeeping, or um, I'm sorry, on a beehive to have those bees there. Okay. So hello again, I'm Trey for the third time. Who's <laughs> <laughs> counting? Um, yeah, so when I go and try to figure out where I'm gonna put some bees at, um, first thing I think about is the sun, because it's just like gardening. So I try to face the hives east so that they can get that sun in the morning, you know, because they're not warm blooded like us, say. But getting that sun in the morning helps them get activated and get out early. Um, the next thing is easy access to the hives, because, you know, the bees going in and out the hives is kind of like an airport. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to stand in front of an airport, so you want to make sure you can get around the backs and other side of it and have somewhere to put the boxes that you take it apart, you know, maybe you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Away from pathways and sidewalks because it is a high traffic area. Yes, it drains because honey and water do not mix. Um, 
And the place they can get for the whole season. So here in Cleveland, um, we got school in, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I was serious. <laughs> I flew to Columbus. But if you flew in, you saw the lake. And for us, especially on the east side, we got a lot of snow. We got a lot of lake effect snow. So sometimes you'll get an alert on your phone and it's 12 inches of snow coming. Mm. You know, that was not there the day before. So you got to make sure you have a little place for them so that the wind drifts of the snow, you know, doesn't get too too much for them and that you can access it and clear it out for them. Um, someone dedicated to check on the hive regularly, be a beekeeper, even in the wintertime. I go by once a month just to make sure I see some activity, uh, maybe feel it, hear them, see something going on. Um, the access to water, most importantly, flowers. So um, when I scout for a place before I even go look for the beehive, I want to look around two, three miles um, in the area to see, are there open fields? Are there places where bees can get flowers year round? Because different things bloom at different times. So it's a lot of thought that goes in before you even put your beehives down. Thank you. Um, so this is an artist workshop. This was at Lincoln West High School. Um, we had, there was an event there, and we were like, this is the perfect opportunity to have the workshop. Um, so we had a local artist come in. His name is Renato de Jesus. Uh, he owns culture, Cultura Clothing. Um, and he brought all these different things for the kids to go in on it and just paint however they wanted to. Um, he did give like some patterns in some spaces, but other than that, they were doing their own thing. Um, these are the, the, uh, the frames. frames. Oh, I'm sorry. So that's what they were building on with Morgan Tiger back there, our director. Um, so they were building these out um, where they would actually build out the comb with the wax and then put either the baby in there, um, the larva, the honey, or the pollen in there. And then this is at Shirley Fells where they were building the Orchard Mason Bee Homes. Um, so they had like little tubes and um, I have my family, I always have my family included in things where they were drilling into like pieces of wood that I found around the yard. Um, and then they got to either stick the tube in there or just leave it like that for the bees to go in there, lay their eggs, or um, kind of just overwinter in that space. Um, and then this is a Hood Honey 216 extraction process. So I don't know if you want to talk around that part. Yeah, so. Um, the slide before you guys saw the frames, it was like black and it was wood on it, right? So these are the frames after the bees build it out. And they have two boxes below, which are the brew boxes, which are basically like the nurseries. And then you get to the third box is usually where they start to put their extra honey. And that's the honey that we take as uh, beekeepers because they need the honey below to survive during the wintertime. So, you get the frames like this, and it's full of wax, has a wax over it, and then you cut it like right over the top, and you can see like the different colors in here. Um, so this yellow stuff is honey, but it's summer honey, spring honey. Mm -hmm. The dark stuff is fall honey, so when I pulled this out last year, it was right in between um, summer and fall. The fall honey is more healthier and darker because of the different flowers that they get. Um, and it contains a lot more minerals. Um, but we cut the wax off, which comes out here, and I'll put the frame inside our bee honey extractor. It's called a honey extractor. Save the wax for stuff like chapstick, different cosmetic products. This thing spins around and empties all these little cells of honey because each one is full of honey. And then you would give this back to the honey so that they don't have to rebuild the wax out. It's already there, so they're just storing it again versus like having to build all that out because now they're spending more time and effort into doing something that they already have done. Um, so the honey extraction, which he just showed, was the honeycomb, the, prepar the preparing the frames, the extraction, and the honey flow. Um, you want to talk more on yeah. that or is that? Yeah, so we talked about the honeycomb and preparing the frames, which would just be cutting them down. And then extraction is when we put in this big cylinder it spins around. You guys ever been to a fair? I'm not sure where everybody's from. <laughs> you went to a fair, you get on that machine, you stick to the wall. You get, <laughs> no yeah. you get nauseous. That's what we got going on here. And the honey goes to the wall and it slides onto the bottom. And 
just a little opening at the bottom, and it comes out and we put it through a filter. And you don't have to put it through a filter, but a filter will get it where most of the big pieces of wax and bee parts come out. But everything's edible, so you know, this year I'm gonna have some honey with all that good stuff in there. People yeah. like it. So. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Um, so these are some of the uh, Bee Bridge Beekeeper. So this is in the Park Foot neighborhood. This is uh, the one that I was mentioning at um, Community College. This is another picture of her. Her name is Danny. Her name is Dahlia. Um, and then I have a mentor here. They showed me in for a picture because I don't like pictures, but they put me in there. <laughs> um, and then this is Johnny Pine from City Life as well. So most of I would say about, we have 11 sites, and I want to say about nine sites are youth involved. Um, so now we're expanding um, the knowledge, right, of beekeeping within the next generation, and a couple of next generations. So um, I think we didn't intentionally did that, but you know, it all falls with purpose that that's just what happened. Um, so this is the Bee Bridge artist. Um, this was the one um, we this is Pastor Randall's uh, church, uh, where she had beekeeping, and she does wraparound services for her community. Um, and she has a community garden there, and has apples and pears, and this is what they what they came up with. Um, so we had some local artists uh, from St. Clair Sprouts. Uh, his name is David Ann Horn. Um, Revolutionary Love Garden, which was Julian Kahn, and then Reynaldo de Jesus at Linguas uh, High School Garden, and then Trey's daughter got to do his uh, painting on his eyes. Um, and then the mentors, we had Elizabeth Emery, G Jill Hinkle Dyer. So she, this is Jill, um, and then Ronnie, of course. But here, Jill's teaching uh, the youth how to start a smoker. So everybody was in the competition of who smokes, you know, whose smoker starts faster and whose smoke is consistent. Um, because when you're beekeeping, you want to do it, you can do it by yourself, but it's always great to have two people because somebody can smoke the bees while you're checking them. Because you have very limited time before the bees get out It's a very scary thing if your smoke <laughs> runs out while the hive is open. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> Not there was a moment where I'm like, surely smoke the bees! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was scary. So it's a lot of lessons learned for sure. Um, so this is, we're going to uh, give Oh. Uh, a moment to talk. Uh, so she runs the urban farm that's called Revolutionary Love Garden, where she had youth there involved this whole summer. Um, and one of the, the girls were like, I want to go check the hive. I was like, let's go. So she put on her suit and she just went over there and she was taking care of the bees by herself with me walking. And then this is your part. Why, hello everybody. How are you? Um, so I'm not going to read all of that, but um, how I got introduced to this project is I have a nonprofit organization that really focuses on using the art to make the community thrive by really facilitating growth and transformation of individuals, whether it's after school programming, whether it's events at the garden. Um, so as a community gardener, the FAIR project, yeah, the FAIR project, I got connected with Tanisha and Morgan, they really are supportive and just helping us expand our reach and expand our ability to connect with different organizations. So Tanisha called and was like, hey, you want to do bees? I said, kids like bees. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> so that's how that came. So, multi-generational. Um, as Tanisha said, she brings her children. I did not bring my three-year-old. You would not be happy if I brought her. <laughs> but she's very much in the garden, like, picking fruit. And so we have, um, from babies all the way up to as old as you, as old as you can go. Uh, we had a couple of field trips at the garden. I was surprised because I thought I was going to introduce them to some bee stuff and they were, the kids were telling me about bees. Um, we also had Wild Youth Workers, which is, which is youth, youth Opportunity Unlimited. So one of the Wild Youth Workers actually got to put on the bees and she went with yeah, Tanisha to do the beekeeping. So, yeah, so. She was called the bee but she yeah, she was. There. <laughs> oh, I got a picture. Community. We're all about community. Um, we give away free produce. 
this is our first year with the honey, so we don't, we're going to do an extraction and people are going to come, but we don't have a lot of honey to give away or to um, go to the farmer's markets, but we do a lot of produce, we do a lot of community events, and that is how this fell right on in line, because we like some stuff that people are excited about. My background is in teaching, and you know when you have young kids, you want to get something that they're really into, so. Bees and bugs are cool. I don't, I like bees. I don't particularly like other bugs, but kids like bugs, so. <laughs> So a lot of what we do is youth guided, it's community, the garden is community guided, but um, we have the largest influences with our youth. So this is the youth, um, while you work, is we're painting the hives with um, guidance of Julian. So, yeah. And then it's just, it's just um, more of that when we had the build the little bee pollinator homes, that's me and Tanisha. That was actually that day, I'm like, <laughs> because I used to have like one box and it was like, oh, we need to put another box. And I'm just like, there's two boxes. So it's just like, you can be this bad. And then just the artwork that the children were doing. And then that's it. Come experience the bees with us. We hope to see you next season. We, um, I love art, so we incorporate art a lot into everything that we do. So as we were painting, a lot of the focus of the painting was the bees and everything they saw around. Yes. So, just remember, I did bring some honey. Oh! Yes, I did. I did bring a little honey so we can taste it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Oh, you can go back to it. Oh, yeah. There you go. So, um, my company is Hood Honey. And uh, like I said before, like it was said about before I started with my friend, we started. He started Leaves of Our Future America, so I started with Honey to Go With It. And the idea was behind the minds of the children in our neighborhood. Picture um, a dog in a box, okay, or a person in a box. You know, I think it's even some experiment man called the Pavlovian dog or something. But these kids, or that dog, they're just in a box. They don't know what is outside of that, you know? So being able to bring bees there, which I spent my own money on the first year, which was expensive, mm -hmm. took out my retirement for it. Oh, Lord, dedication, um, dedication. But I believed in it. Amen. You know, um, so coming into the second year, we were working with Ohio State, and we got the Summer Scrub Program, which allowed us to go into some empty lots here in Cleveland, because there's a lot of them, and make a farm. So here you see our farm, which is here. Oh, it's great fruits that it grew. Um, but this picture with the kids is actually my grandmother's backyard. Um, so I kind of went back there and started to build there. So coming into this year, I got an email from Ohio State and Summer Sprout saying, hey, you know, someone else has bees that are free. And I was like, yeah, because, you know, I've spent all my money. <laughs> so, but then I met Tanisha and Morgan, and I got to hook up with Shirley. And the picture before, we saw another student named Danny, who was like right here in the middle, a good friend of mine. Um, and I got to teach, even though I wasn't really ready to start teaching adults how to do it, but you know, there was a need. And I just did what we all do nowadays. I went on YouTube and Google. And, <laughs> did my best and learn, but it was great to have the Bee Bridge project there because I got to interact with Shirley, who's great. I love her daughter and her son. <laughs> She's a personality, but she had tear this place up. <laughs> <laughs> but the bees um, bring people together because everybody loves honey or mm -hmm. needs help with their skincare or get a cut and want to put some honey on it or get chapped lips and use some beeswax. But it really brought, it really introduced me to a lot of people this year. Um, and just the whole Bee Bridge program was great because we actually ended up being on the news not too long ago, which was pretty cool. Um, but if you can see here, we give the kids straws um, when we do our first class with the kids because bees have a ton called proboscis, which is like a straw. So we have the kids use their imagination and tap into their intuition to really become a bee, mm -hmm. so that they can understand what it's like to be a bee so that when they go and walk over and actually see the bees doing the things that we talked about, it 
and really open up their mind to anything. And one last thing, um, a big reason, a big inspiration is my friend named Sam, um, who started Weeds of Our Future America. But one thing he said, because he grew up right here, he said, man, we went out to Chagrin Falls, which is 14 miles from here tops, and they played basketball, and that just opened up his mind. And he had no clue that this space he can live existed because all he knew was his neighborhood. So, you know, it's so important that you that we have this program here because, you know, these kids all live in the hood, which I don't know if you guys know what hood is or what it means, but hood is just a neighborhood, but you know, it's a tough neighborhood, so you know, it's not an easy neighborhood. So that's why it's called good honey, because you know, honey is the taste of honey is from where you're at. But with that being said, each and every one of these kids that took them all home uh, live in the hood. And this is our opening for them. And it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, like in every project, there's always lessons learned. Um, so, some of the things is just making sure that the sites are good, right? Uh, it's a permanent spot for the bees. Um, I did the mistake of moving the bees, and then I found out later on that you're only supposed to move them three inches at a time. Um, and then I ended up moving them way too far, because uh, they, they leave and then they don't come back to sunset in a way, so that was a lesson that I learned for sure. Um, so just allowing a uh, community to be aware of the site. Uh, we had another site where some kids, you know, playing around or whatever they were doing, they kind of knocked the hive down. Um, so I had to go at 7 a.m. rescue the bees, and then I got some too many times. Um, so that was another thing. Uh, just, uh, let, let me see, so creating regular training opportunities for new and experienced beekeepers to connect as well. So a lot of the things is like mentors, right? Um, just having the mentor that you can call and let them know like, hey, this is going on, this is looking funny. Um, so that was another lesson. Um, building those partnerships with elected officials and neighborhood groups to share information. The more people that are aware that the highs are there, the more accepted they are. Mm -hmm. um, and just the more opportunity you're building for people to actually go check the hive out and just be a support group in a way. Um, so organizing events is, is a lot of work. It takes a lot of text messages and calls and emails. Um, so kind of just having a system already built in place um, is very, it's a very good thing and it, and it helps save a lot of time as well. Um, be clear about the time commitment needed for mentors so they, so they are there when they need to be. Um, and then develop clear roles and responsibilities for all project partners. So those are just some of the lessons that we learned. Um, so what's next for the Bee Bridge Project? So I don't know if you guys know, but this is City Hall's group right here. And then we're staring at the lake that way. So um, one of the projects uh, that uh, Sophia and Joe wanted to do was have bees on that roof. And I'm like, Joe, I don't know about this. Um, so it didn't happen this year, but we're in conversation for next year. Um, so Trey will be actually the beekeeper taking care of the bees up there on that site. Um, so continually supporting those beekeepers um, and the hives that we have currently, just to create that sustainability for, those, uh, for the bees. Um, creating more opportunities for community education and more youth involvement and outreach through programs like 4-H. We've noticed that it's a lot of interest with the youth. Um, so how do we keep building on that? Um, hosting community events where multiple sites come together and of course fundraising for future sustainability. And then these are our partners and funders, so Revolutionary Love Garden, Hood Honey, Cultura Clothing. Um, he wasn't able to make it today. He was in Puerto Rico. He's flying back in today for some um, hurricane relief. Uh, U.S. Commission for Immigrants and Refugees, Lincoln West High School, St. Clair Sprouts Community Garden, Cleveland Over Everything, uh, Garfield Community Gardens, and Neighborhood Connections. I think there's one Oh, okay. So I had the slide. I guess. Uh, so Shirley has an event on Friday, mm. which that's the event where they're going to be extracting the bees. Um, I'm sorry, the honey mm -hmm. from the bees. So mm -hmm. we can share that information with uh, with you guys and those you guys can find out. Mm -hmm. All right, and if anything, just connect with Shirley. It'll be a fun time. We have grains coming up. It's been a struggle, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, thank so. you all for your time, um, and I appreciate it. Yes.
So she would become the mentor for the new beekeeper. So it's up to her where she would want to do it, where it's a good location, right? So we want to make sure that there's enough sunlight. We want to make sure that it's not, I heard you guys have a lot of weddings at that. Yes, uh, we do. Oh, yeah. So that's another thing that we want to be more aware of because we don't want that to, you know, to mess anything up. And then, of course, the lower part, we have LLK running across. Yeah. So that's really busy. Mm -hmm. and the, Possibly the awful one, but that's that's very exciting stuff. Thank you. Congratulations. So it should be up next summer. Yes. So we'll start. Uh, we'll we'll stay in conversation through the winter, and then um, we'll start planning for drop off and um, like building the hives in April, so that they can be you know March, and then they'll be dropped in April, right? Yep. Late April or May. Mm -hmm. okay. And then somebody from the garden is going to. Look after those things. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. That's nice. Uh, I I realized from the past uh, news things that the bee population took a big hit for the last number of years. I'm not sure, exactly sure if it was a disease of some sort or what. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with that. But besides that, are these uh, projects? Is, it's here in Cleveland you're working. Uh, are there other cities in the states that are working on it? Um, so we're just aware about the one, you know, there's beekeepers everywhere, but the one that we're most on is the one here in Cleveland. Um, we didn't have any issues with our bees besides swarming. So I don't know if you guys are aware what swarming is, but it's when the hives grow too much. Uh, they'll create another queen, and then half of the hive will go with them. And are there any actinized bees or anything like that? Was a problem too. I'm just curious if there's a, you know, the type of bees and how that works. If uh, there's any problems like that. I think we had Italian bees. I don't know if that's. So I'm not an expert by no means, but I feel like I may be making this up. I feel like invasive species have a lot to do with it. And I wonder how um, how we're tearing down our green spaces to make room for other things, how that has to do with it. Because like we talked about the flowers and be able, like there's a, a symbiotic relationship between gardens and between bees, particularly part of the draw was um, I had a problem with my cucumbers and different like vegetables that flower and then go into vegetables and somebody said well you have to um what did they say Can't pollinate them. you have to pollinate them you have to get the male species and the female species in the room I said, I'm not doing I'm not going around my garden and doing that we're just not gonna have but then if you have bees they naturally do it so as we're um, tearing down green spaces and if we don't have flowers and stuff so they already in more competition for other species that are coming in whether they're native whether they're like there was like whether native or not native and they're coming in and they're they're competing for food, and then we're tearing down more of their food, so where are they going <laughs> to go? Yeah. So a big thing with the bees, um, it's a couple issues. Um, one, the big issue we have mainly is the varroa mite, mm. which is, you know, everything has some kind of pest. So picture like the dog having fleas, and they basically bite into the bee and suck the bee's blood and pass disease. Yeah, so, you know, especially here in Cleveland, going in through the winter, our hive usually won't make them unless we do something um, proactive about them. Um, and then another thing, like Shirley was saying, is it's not enough food. There's a lot of competition for food. So, um, are you guys from Cleveland? Are you from Cleveland? Y'all are from Cleveland. Everybody's from Cleveland? Go Cleveland. Okay, I'm sorry, you're thinking people are not We from thought you guys came in from other places. Not in but with that being said, like, um, when you go home or you ride home, look at the front grass. Mm -hmm. It's all grass, it's all just turf. There are no flowers there. So there's space for flowers, but we don't have flowers. So one thing 
about my company and why we chose to be in the hood was because don't nobody cut their grass. Mm -hmm. and don't nobody put down pesticides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know? pesticides. So we are in a, actually a very clean area and pesticides is the next thing. So don't put down pesticides. Learn to live with dandelions because they're beautiful mm -hmm. um, and eat them because they're healthy. Um, and yeah, like those are the three main things basically. So that's why, that's why we're having a big issue with that. Yeah, and that was another thing about the project. Um, we gave seeds that are native to Ohio that bees actually like. So they got to plant them and then, um, you know, it just gave more opportunity for the bees to actually enjoy the flowers. I know lately, I, I did a project a couple of years back or I, I worked, helped them, it was like the watershed, I'm not done. It was, there's, lately there's been about a lot about, um, what do they call them? Like rain. Rain runoff. And there's like the garden that you plant to like a oh, native. Like a rain garden. Mm -hmm. rain yeah, garden. rain garden. Those would be amazing. Those are amazing for bees. And it's amazing for the environment. So that's a really a positive thing also. Native species. So I just mentioned dandelion, right? right? Dandelion is not native here. You know, it's not from Ohio. It's not from America. It's like from Europe and Asia. You know, but some native flowers here, when you, if you actually look up native flowers, they look pretty exotic. Mm -hmm. And then you realize like, oh, it's from here. I just have never, you don't see them. Only things we see on the regular are things that are not from here. So like the native flowers are like something everybody should definitely like do a little research on because it's, like you can plant those, you don't have to just plant the typical things you see. You can plant a bunch of beautiful flowers in your front yard that are native to Ohio. And this is kind of off topic, but not really. The more I've gotten into gardening, the more I've had the question like, what is a weed? Is it a weed? Yeah. What defines a weed? Because I, no such thing. I saw, I'm like, they they sell dandelion greens at Heinen's. Like, I can go, like, is that is this how much they're going for? Or there's like, I'm really into like the different herbs and things like that. So I'm like, this, and somebody gave me, it's called Picture This. And there's an app where you take a picture and it tells you what species. And I started taking pictures. I said, oh. I could just harvest this right here. So it's just really like you're tearing down stuff or like pulling weeds. I don't want this. And pesticides are horrible, everybody. Public service announcement. And a, a lot of those, a lot of those weed, those weeds out there you can eat. Yeah. Like the dandelion. And then there's something called purslane, which looks weird. It doesn't, it looks like a little weird, but it's like, it's good for greens. It's like a good leafy green. And then you, it's a plant I use called plantain. So when I get stung by a bee, I take a little plantain and a little spit and put on a bee sting and it takes away the pain um, for a period of time. But yeah, like, there are no such thing as weeds. I think it's a big question about the mechanics of the extracting process that gets pretty involved. Does every beekeeper have their own machine like you were describing? Or do you have to like, take the, the rack somewhere? Yeah. yeah. So you, for, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so you don't have, I use an extractor because it's easier. Mm -hmm. um, and I have one available to me last year and then I'm buying one this year. But like, you could feasibly just go and pull it all off by hand and just scrape it all down and put it through some cheesecloth so you get the same amount of honey. Um, it's just gonna be really messy. Cause the, the process I use is already messy. So. And for this project, uh, for the Bee Bridge project, we did a communal one. So we purchased one, 
Um, and then if Shirley's ready to extract, it'll go to Shirley. Then once she's done, I'll pick it up, I'll clean it out, then I'll take it to, um, to Danny's, right? And then it'll just keep moving around after it's been clean and disinfected. This is how you get things out of the movie. Like, uh, no, I'm going to just... It comes in like various sizes, <laughs> but, um, you know, between, like, this big and yeah. this big. I mean, it's, it it's industrial size, and depending on how big you want to buy them. But I bought mine for, like... 200 or 250 dollars yeah. and it was just it fits two frames in there it's about you know two and a half three feet wide plug to the wall it's kind of short but you know it works it's the cheapest option <laughs> yeah we uh purchased a lot of items through blue sky beekeeping um so she is a wonderful person she's very knowledgeable um shares all her wisdom um and then she also has youtube videos that tells you about each process um, so that's where we purchased a lot of the things, was from that company. It's a nice little drive, too. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you clarify what you mean when you talk about smoking the bees? So, go I ahead, can mentor. Or oh, so, I can okay. take this. <laughs> <laughs> so, first thing. So, it's, mm, my family likes to do bonfires. Kind of like barbecue, kind of like bonfires. The goal is to get a constant supply of smoke that's not going to be too hot but it's going to be constant supply it's a machine too it's, oh it's it's, oh it's so a, it's like another tool um and then you just want to yeah yeah so what's the point of smoking oh oh because it keeps them calm have you ever heard bees humming like one if you hear like hundreds of bees humming at the same time, it will make you sweat. So it keeps them calm and it kind of, um, so bees communicate by like, um, sim like what is it, dancing or pheromones. <laughs> this is so they communicate by pheromones. Last one, last one. <laughs> and so all I know is that the smoke kills it. But so the smoke keeps them from communicating. It kills all the communication. So when there's like, oh, there's intruder, intruder. If there wasn't any, um, smoke, it'd be like the all the army would come together and just target you. And that and let me tell you, so when I first got I'm like, oh these are my bees, these are my pets. They were so nice when Trey was here. They were so behaved. I so I'm like, I just gotta go do one thing right quick. I went to go and it was like boom, 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 boom. and I didn't have anything on and I had be they it's not funny, but they were literally like I'm like is this they felt like army planes like, yeah. so it's to keep them calm, it keeps them relaxed. And when you start running out of the smoke, they, they start humming, gets louder and louder and louder. And that's when you know you just need to hurry up and close it up. But make sure it's not, you have to make sure it's not too hot because you can kill them. And they do something that's called porching, right? Porching. Where they, yeah, where it gets hot and like, you know how our house, if it gets too hot, we sit on the porch. Mm -hmm. So oh, they period. do the same thing. Oh yeah, poor, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they do the same thing. So I got a lot of text messages like, is this normal? Are my bees leaving? And I'm like, no, it's just too hot. And that's just their way of coming out and getting air and going back in. Any other questions? Oh Lord. Hey Morgan. Oh, hey. <laughs> uh, what I want to hear from each of you, what advice you might have for people who want to get involved in beekeeping? Maybe something you've learned or we want to pass on. Oh yeah, so the first advice I would give somebody is make sure you're not allergic. Mm -hmm. um, but then after that, the next advice I would give is if you decide to get into beekeeping, really think about it and try to work your way into not wearing a suit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, I'm not there yet. Not wear the suit. Uh, yeah. it, it is easier, it allows you, so. It's safer for the bees too. As a man, as a man, as an adult man who is learning about women and finally learn how to get into his feminine side. Realizing that bees are a bunch of women. 90% ah! women, but you have to be gentle. So when you have gloves on, you can't be yeah. gentle. So the more gentle you are with the bees, the less smoke you have to use, the less they're on attack, and the more you can get intimate with them. And get the goodness, because they make something called propolis. Mm. Propolis is how they line up their house to keep the cold out. But it's antiviral, antifungal, and antibacterial. So good. So when I touch that, it gets into my skin and into my blood. It helps me be healthier. This is just my own personal opinion about the getting healthier thing because I used to have crow's feet 
like right here on the side of my eyes, but they are not there anymore. So I'm gonna give it up to the bees. Um, but yes, you wanna work to being like, you know, very intimate with the bees. When you go into the hive, you don't always kill bees, but it's one or two that you just didn't see and weren't in the way. And imagine having those big gloves and be like, versus gently being able to put it down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I would say is to be realistic about the amount of time that you have to get dedicate to your bees. So I have a, a garden or a farm, and for instance, I just went in, weeded a whole box, and just like, we're just gonna throw seeds, 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 seeds. We had a whole bunch of rain, so I was happy about that. Come back in a couple weeks, pots of little greens. <coughs> Bees, you cannot just be like, oh, I'll come back in a couple weeks and see how you are. It doesn't work like that. It's a lot um, more high maintenance than farming. Honestly, if I didn't have Trey with me, my bees might not have survived. I'm very used to um, being able to navigate things a little differently. So when you have bees, it's very much so every seven days, seven to 10 days, you need to be out there. And not just like, oh, I'm gonna peek and look, but have like an hour to actually pull out everything and look to see if you have those, what is the name of the? the swarm cells. Oh, those, yes, importantly, but also the, the, the pests or whatever they oh, are, yeah, the and to see about that, because if you don't, it can go, um, it can go bad fast. So just to be able to, um, yeah, to dedicate time to it is a big deal. Um, for me, it's to have uh, somebody to talk to about the bees, or if it's a group or a mentor, or something, somebody that is a, another eye and, and just a bank of knowledge um, that you can as support, right? And then just having the right tools. Um, I'm not there where Trey's at, like no suit. I actually went backwards. I didn't have a suit on, then I had a suit. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, and then just being patient with yourself because you are, they, they might swarm, some bees might die, some queens might die, you know? So it's a lot of things that can happen that you just want to prevent. Um, but sometimes nature does take its course and you just got to be patient with yourself. I have one more Thanks. thing to add. I'm sorry. Children are not as scared of bees. Just be clear, they're not scared and we don't want to make them scared, but the younger they are especially, they will run towards the hive and bees don't care how young you are. They will come, so that's an important thing. Thank you so much to uh, the presenters for being here and asking, uh, answering all the questions that our audiences have. And if you have any questions, you can ask them at the conclusion of this panel. Um, another key part of this project was when we started it, we wanted to have the international community in Cleveland work together with the persons who are already here. So that was like one of the part that Global Cleveland was, you know, most interested in working with the Portuguese refugees uh, in the Jefferson Park, or sorry, the Marfield Park and the Valera Curtis neighborhood, and uh, they were very interested in beekeeping, and their way of beekeeping was completely different. Very different. Very different from how it is here. So the smoking part was completely unknown to them. No <gasps> gloves. And then uh, no gloves, nothing. No, no. And then even the high, it, the beehives are also built very differently. So they were, you know, um, very used to building hives in a bamboo. Like they would just cut on the side, they have like a hole where they could like, you know, if one side would be blocked and the other side would be open where they would put just a line of honey and then, then the bees would come and then make hives in there. Mm -hmm. And they would just keep a small space so that there's like, you know, enough air to uh, pass by and everything. And it was wow. warm and safe for them. Yeah. So it was completely different when we like, started talking about that. So this particular community relation between the Indian community with the local residents was very important for us. Having said that, uh, I would like to thank you all uh, so much for taking your time to, um, you know, be in this panel and our presenters to speak for our audiences. Uh, so it is time to let me to wrap up. Um, and also thanking our sponsors again. Our sponsors are Eaton Corporation, Swage Law, Cleveland Hungarian Development Panel, the University of Akron, Cleveland Rotary Club, the Romanian American Community Cleveland Chapter, uh, Slovenian Museum and Archives, the City of Cleveland, 
and our hopes to include the public library. So the next panel will be in this room at 3 p.m. Uh, be sure to come back here about immigration integration at the city level featuring Deputy Mayor of the Dance of Poland, uh, Monika Chaibor, uh, Chabior, uh, Olivia Haibach from Welcoming America, and Elisa uh, Hernandez from Director of Community Development for the City of Poland. Until then, please do, please do grab a snack outside and check out our Slovenian architecture. How do you keep these? Thank you. Thank you.